Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome you all to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Los Alamos on this first Sunday of Advent. A special welcome to our guests this morning. For those who are worshiping with us online, thank you for welcoming us into your home, wherever you're gathered this morning. I'm Reverend John Nash. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning. Dylan is our lay reader. Uh, Yelena is on piano. Valerie in the choir and bells will be leading us in our hymns this morning. In the sound booth, we have Don, Peggy, uh, Lynn, and Linda, and Jolene, and... Um, Lauren, our ushers, to thank you to them for their worship leadership this morning. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said, Whoever you are and whatever faith you were born, whatever creed you confess, if you have come here to find God, you are welcome here, and we are indeed glad that you are here with us. We begin a new worship series for this Advent season entitled The Ghosts of Christmas. And so we hope that you have come with the expectation that we will encounter the risen Christ, that the Holy Spirit will be moving and working amongst us here this morning, that we'll be transformed simply by gathering together as the body of Christ. So I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Remain seated if that is more comfortable. The Nash family will be coming forward to lead us in the lighting of our first Advent candle. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday in which we recall the hope we have in Christ. The prophets of Israel all spoke of the coming of Christ, of how a Savior would be born, a king in the line of David. On Christmas Day, the Christ of our hope was born. On Good Friday, the Christ of our hope died. On Easter Day, the Christ of our hope rose from the dead. Then he ascended into heaven. On the last day, the Christ of our hope will come again to establish his kingdom over all things on earth. As followers of Christ, we await his return. We light this candle of hope to remember that as he came to us as humbly in the manger at Bethlehem and gave light to the world, so he is coming again in power to deliver his, to his people. Together, let us pray. Loving God, Love of God, we thank you for the hope you give us. Help us prepare our hearts for the Lord's coming. Bless our worship. Help us live holy and righteous lives. We ask it in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you are comfortable for our opening hymn, as we once again call for our Emmanuel to come once again.
Together, let us pray our prayer for illumination. Speak to us, O Lord. Speak to us in these Advent days. Speak to us through the waiting and watching, the hoping and longing, the sorrowing and sighing, the merriment and rejoicing. Speak to us by your word and walk with us until the day of your coming. Amen. Our first scripture is the introduction to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Our second reading is similarly from the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, the first time that we are aware of that the term gospel or good news is used in relation to Jesus, creating a new genre of literature, the gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the good news of the coming of Christ. Thanks be to God. If you have celebrations, concerns, or hopes to lift up to God this morning, you are invited to come forward and light a candle. And you may also fill out a prayer card to be lifted up in prayer later during worship. For those worshiping online, you are also invited to light a candle where you are and to put your prayer requests in the comments section or submit them through the Church Center app as we continue worshiping with, one, with another Advent call to once again prepare to receive the Christ child.
using your scripture insert, I invite you to take that out on the back as a place to write things to remember from today's service. So I want you to think of one of your favorite Christmas memories. Now I'm willing to bet that for most of us, they did not involve a gift we received or a gift that we gave. This is true even if you were trying to remember a favorite memory from childhood. There might have been a bike, right, or a special gift that you might remember that stands out for us. But most of the time, the favorite memories of Christmas that we lift up are experiences we had. Time spent with family and friends, maybe it was decorating a tree or a special meal or a special guest that came one time. Maybe it was a visit to Santa. For me, it was going around looking at Christmas lights, which is the reason my house looks the way it does at Christmas. And we might remember opening presents, but I'm willing to bet, again, that we don't remember particularly what gifts we got. Just think of last Christmas, less than a year ago, could you name five gifts that you got last year? I've been thinking about it for a while, and I couldn't do it. And the only reason I could tell you what our girls got for Christmas is because we have pictures of it. And so I can look back at those and remember what those gifts are. And yet, even though we don't remember the gifts we received, that we remember these events or special things happening, we are constantly told that Christmas is about gift-giving. It's about going to the mall and buying that special thing for that person because if we don't get the right gift for them, it will mean that we don't actually love them. And if it's our children, it means that they will end up in therapy as adults blaming us for everything that's gone wrong in their lives because we didn't get them the super hot gift that one Christmas. As one person said about our spending habits, We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. And yet, even though we know that these thoughts about Christmas are not true, year after year, we keep doing the same thing. And in some ways, paying the same price year after year. Sometimes we do it because it's tradition and it's what you have to do at Christmas. And sometimes it's because we don't We can't imagine doing it any other way. In Charles Dickens' classic story, A Christmas Carol, which greatly impacted our understanding and practices of Christmas and its attendant celebrations, the main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, is visited by four ghosts. The first is his former business partner, Jacob Marley, who as a ghost is covered in chains and who comes to warn Scrooge that if he continues doing the same things he's doing now, living the same way, that bad things will happen to him. And he says that after him, he will receive three ghosts in that night. And the first ghost that comes to him, besides Jacob, is appropriately enough the ghost of Christmas past who helps Scrooge to come to remember what Christmas used to be like for him as a child so that he can then change and move into the future and become someone different. Because it turns out that Scrooge wasn't always a Scrooge. Actually, he was always a Scrooge because that's the family name, but he was not the person we associate now with that term of Scrooge. And so following the ghost's Lead And that that, uh, quoting from Isaiah we heard in the gospel passage this morning, we are going to prepare the way to make our paths straight, prepare for the coming of the Christ child once again. To try and free ourselves from the chains and fetters that hold us back from keeping and celebrating the Christmas we might want to celebrate. And I will just say that if you are celebrating Christmas exactly the way you want it, you can't imagine anything being different. The next three weeks are not for you. But if you like to see maybe some things change, but you're not quite sure what to do, this might be appropriate. Now, one of the problems we, we have when we encounter the season of Christmas is that we 
often think, if only it could be like that magical time that existed in the past, then everything would be great. Right? The problem is not how we used to do Christmas, it's how we do Christmas now. Except that magical moment that we think exists doesn't actually ever exist. In the 1890s, store clerks and shoppers were riding uh, and bemoaning the long hours that stores were open of rude customers and rude store clerks, bemoaning the rush and the hustle and bustle of Christmas and wishing it would all go away. That's not the 1990s. That's the 1890s. And at the turn of the century, people were complaining about how early Christmas celebrations were coming, that people couldn't even wait for Thanksgiving to get past, that Christmas ads began right at the time of Halloween. That's not the turn of the 21st century, that's the turn of the 20th century. 120 years ago, people were complaining about the exact same things we complain about now. That mythical time just doesn't exist. But we also have to know that most of the traditions that we have that surround Christmas are not really all that old. There are some, like gift-giving, although not the way we celebrate gift-giving now, but with only a few exceptions, most of the Christmas traditions that we have began in the mid-19th century. And they're greatly influenced by the writings of Washington Irving, Clement Clark Moore, whose a uh, poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, appeared 200 years ago this month. And also then, of course, Charles Dickens. In 2017, there was a movie came out. You might have seen it called The Man Who Invented Christmas. It was about Dickens. And that's largely true, that he, along with Irving and Moore, sort of domesticated Christmas, changed its celebration, and in some ways simultaneously commercialized Christmas. And just to give you a hint that Christmas has not always been this way, in Puritan New England, Christmas was actually banned. You could not celebrate Christmas for several years. You want to talk about a war on Christmas, that's where you have to go to. And the Methodist Church in America was founded at what is called the Christmas Conference in 1784. You want to guess why it was called the Christmas Conference? Because it began on Christmas Eve and ran over Christmas Day and for several more days. And they chose those dates because it was the time of the year that were slowest in the church and clergy could get away from their circuits and go to Baltimore for a meeting. Can you imagine a church holding a meeting over Christmas Eve and Christmas Day today? Now in Mark's Gospel which if you were here when we did the series on the Gospel of Mark, I called it the, the Gospel without a beginning and end. Because it doesn't have a birth narrative. Originally, it doesn't have a resurrection story either. Instead, Mark begins with John the Baptist appearing out in the wilderness, the one who prepared the way, again, quoting from the prophet Isaiah. And from what we know about John... He doesn't seem like a fun guy to be around. He's not the one you would want to invite to your Christmas party, definitely not to your New Year's Eve party, because he's kind of a sourpuss, right? He's wearing camel's hair. This is not like a Brooks Brothers camel hair uh, suit coat, right? This is coarse clothing to remind him that he's a, a sinner, and he eats locusts with honey, which is his dipping sauce for the locust. And there are some people around who think that John is the one who's been promised, that he is the Messiah. But John says, no, I am just the one who will prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, who prepares the way for the coming of Christ. So that means that the, the things that he, he is doing do not determine the future, because those are yet to come. John is sort of setting that pathway for Christ to come yet. He does not establish the way things have to be, because in the words of Paul, Christ will make all things new. And the same is true with us. Because the ghost of Christmas past can show us what has happened, how we got to where we are today, 
the ups and downs of our lives. But what the ghost also shows us is that this is not the way things have to be or the way things will be. The traditions and patterns and rituals of Christmas, the way we celebrate, don't have to remain the same. Just as Scrooge ends up changing his life and the way he lives in order to reclaim the wonder and magic of Christmas, so too is that change possible for us. And so I invite you, as we begin this Advent journey, to think about what it is and why it is that you do the things in this season that you do. And then to ask, is it still necessary? Is it still needed? Does it need to be done this way? Because I remember when I was a child that we would always get oranges in our stockings. And I could never figure out why. It wasn't until I was a late teen or maybe an early adult that it occurred to me that my parents, who are in their 80s, and I apologize, Mom, for what I'm about to say, right? When they were growing up, and this is true for many of you, you couldn't just go to the grocery store any time of the year and pick up whatever produce you wanted, right? So an orange at Christmas was incredibly special because you couldn't get it otherwise. That wasn't true when I was growing up, certainly not true now, right? Oranges are not special because, again, we can go down to any grocery store and pick what we need up. So that tradition didn't make any sense because the world had changed. And so that means sometimes our traditions lose their meaning and they too have to change. I was having a conversation with someone whose grandparents were immigrants from Italy And when they came to the United States, they opened up an Italian restaurant. And he said that the restaurant was closed every Sunday, first so that they could go to church in the morning, being good Roman Catholics. And then in the afternoon and in the evening, the whole family would gather together. And right as the the family got larger, as generations moved on, the, the number of people there continued to grow. And his grandfather would cook a massive Italian feast. Right? All the best things you can imagine of, of Italian cooking, desserts and pastas and everything else. He said that was their tradition. It's a tradition he still continues with his family, his now adult daughters, and their family still come to his house on Christmas afternoon to gather for this meal. But he said they don't eat the same things that they, he ate when he was growing up with his grandfather because they would all die of massive coronaries at very young ages, which is actually what happened to his grandfather. So they continue this tradition of gathering every Sunday for a family meal, but the meal itself is very different. Right? They found what is the core of that tradition and got rid of the things that didn't make any sense anymore still do that core of that tradition, and they've changed things around it. The practice has changed. The tradition has remained the same. And so the ghosts of Christmas past show us how things came to be. They help us to remember how they developed. And they show us what is the core of that memory, not the thing we have to keep doing exactly the same way year after year. They show how things change over time, and they move us then on to the Christmas present, which is the ghost we look at next week. But what the ghost of Christmas past also does is show us how we were as children. I mean, Scrooge tries to to dismiss that. If you remember the story when he sees how he was as a child, he said, well, I I was naive, right? I didn't know any better. But what the ghost of Christmas past shows us is to remember what it was like when we were children. To remember the magic of flying reindeer and presents and twinkling lights glistening on new fallen snow. How wondrous that was. You remember how long it took to get from Thanksgiving or, or December 1st to, to December 25th when you were a child? Right now the time flies by, but in that sense of amazement and expectation, those days took forever. There was a magic 
in those moments. It was an understanding of the miracle of Christmas, of the miracle of a newborn child, the miracle of the greatest gift the world has ever received. So the ghost of Christmas past can also help us to reconnect to that magic of Christmas. To move past that hustle and bustle and the idea that some of us have, if we can just get through this, then everything will be better on the other side. Right? Help me survive the Christmas season so we can get into the new year. But we can reclaim that magic if we're open to it. And so the thing we need to remember from the ghost of Christmas past, and also from John the Baptist, is that we have the power to change. John says, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I know we're a ways past from Pentecost when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we receive what? Okay, one person. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we receive what? Power. The power to do the work of God in the world. The power to change and be changed. The power to understand that with Christ Jesus, all things are possible. That we are not locked into the patterns of the past. That we are locked into the power of the presence. And that we can change. That we're called to change. We are called to be transformed through Christ. And in turn to transform the world. So one of the questions that the Advent Conspiracy asks, we've been working through the Advent Conspiracy in our programming night tonight at 4 o'clock. We'll continue in that. But Advent Conspiracy says, or asks, can Christmas still change the world? Can Christmas still change the world? And the answer, of course, is yes, but it requires us to be ready and willing and able to reclaim that Christmas of the past Reclaim the mystery and magic of of Christmas like it was when we were children so we can transform Christmas not just for today, but Christmas for generations to come. To establish new traditions and patterns that will carry us into the future. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. I invite you to stand as... You are able to remain seated if that's more comfortable for our hymn of response. We want to walk as a child of light, and you'll notice that there are some uh, themes from Revelation still continuing in this Advent hymn.
and you may be seated. Before we lift up our celebrations and concerns to God, we'd like to lift up some of the work of the church for those in the sanctuary. You'll find uh, in your worship guide uh, uh, announcements um, that are happening. A couple we'd like to highlight. First is that this evening is part of programming night. We will be doing soup and song, one of my favorite activities. So we'll um, do programming night first, talking about at Advent Conspiracy, then at 5 o'clock. So that begins at 4. 5 o'clock we'll gather for um, singing some of the great uh, songs of Christmas, not just the ones in the, the hymnal, but also secular songs, so to speak. Uh, and we'll then break for a soup uh, dinner. So you're invited to bring uh, soup to share or just come and uh, join us for that. Uh, for those who have picked up packets for the Mendenalis families, uh, it says in there that the gifts are actually due next Friday and Saturday. That is incorrect. They are due on the evening of the 15th or the morning of the 16th. So you have an extra week in there. Uh, the truck will leave at 9 a.m. on the 16th, so uh, presents need to be in there. Um, but if you do have everything purchased by next Sunday, their youth group will be uh, having a lock-in, and part of that, they will be wrapping Christmas presents, uh, not just for men and Alice. If you would like your other Christmas presents wrapped, uh, drop them off at the church this week, uh, and they'll be wrapping them on Thursday and, uh, or sorry, Friday and Saturday. Uh, you can pick them up on Sunday at worship or uh, the next week. Um, so, You'll, again, lots of other things happening for Advent and Christmas, so we invite you to, to look at those. One of our expectations is it will be prayer at least once a day. So in your uh, worship guide, you'll find a list of celebrations and concerns we were aware of earlier this week. And in the scripture insert, you'll find a list of the families of the church to be in prayer for this week. That's one of our membership vows is to pray for one another. So we invite you to uh, make use of those, take it home, and a couple of others to, to add to our your list. Um, Found out this morning that Gail Little is fighting pneumonia, so please be in prayer for Gail for healing. Uh, and the continued uh, prayers for Iris, Susan Denver Children's Hospital is doing well, uh, but still needs our prayers as well as for Sarah and the family. So let us go to God with our celebrations and concerns. God of power and glory, we remember your awesome deeds across the ages, the times you saved us and brought us home. Yet we also remember times when we have felt alone and afraid. O oh God, we are your people, the work of your hand. Look upon us with your shining face, especially in times of need. We pray for those who look to you for healing and hope. For those who are sick or recuperating from illness and injury. For those who are lonely and in need of compassion and care. Those for whom the holidays bring sorrow or pain. Those whose deep sadness overshadows joy. Let your face shine upon them, O God. We pray for people in need of restoration and reconciliation. For those battling addictions and those in recovery. For people estranged from those they love. For someone lost in grief. For those far from home. Let your face shine upon them, O God, that they may be saved. Renew the spirit of a world grown weary with waiting and hoping. Especially we pray for wars to end, for hunger and poverty to be crowded out by abundance. And we pray, too, for the church, because we have also grown weary in our waiting and watching for your power and glory to be made known. Grant us clarity, passion, and true fellowship so that we are awake to your presence. Let your face shine upon the church and all this weary world, we pray, O God, in the name of the one who was born in a manger and who will come again on the clouds of glory. And all the church says, Amen. So in this Advent season, there are lots of ways that you can participate uh, in changing the world, changing people's lives, not just Mendenalis, but our our food pantry, uh, which you'll find outside, 
um, also supporting LA Cares, the way that many of you are volunteering uh, in the community. I saw many of you uh, yesterday, lots of events happening in town for uh, the winter weekend. Um, so thank you to that, as well as the special offering we take on Christmas Eve uh, to go to Rio Reba uh, Imagination Library. So thank you for the ways that you make a difference in people's lives. So one of our membership vows is that we'll support this church uh, with our, not just our time, but also with our money, which we say is giving a portion of our income with a tithe or 10% as the goal. There are several ways you can uh, give this morning. For those in the sanctuary, we'll pass around the offering plates in a few moments. You can place your offering into that. If you give it electronically, you'll find a green card in the pew. You can place that into the plate. <coughs> if you'd like to give electronically, you can do so through our website, firstinyourheart.org. You can also give through the Church Center app or on the green card. There's a QR code. You can scan that. It'll take you to those locations. Follow those steps. You can also text the dollar amount you'd like to give to 84321. Follow those steps uh, or mail in your church checks to the church. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making a difference. We are indeed God's love in action. If the ushers would please come forward to receive this morning's offering. For the doxology is the same, but the words have changed, so you'll find them on your screen and also in your worship guide. We continue with our prayers of celebration by gathering at Christ's table. So I invite you to remain standing as you are comfortable. Be seated if that is more comfortable. Christ our Lord calls to his table all who are hurt and beaten down by the stresses of life. All who love him and earnestly seek to live in peace with one another. All who repent of their sin and long to follow the call of discipleship as we confess together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. 
We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And as a sign of giving thanks, I invite you as you're called to extend your arms in front of you as that sign of giving. It is right to give you thanks and praise, great God of the coming dawn. For in each new day, you surprise the earth with splendor. Your spirit moves across the face of the waters and brings forth life. At the dawn of all things, in the garden you worked the earth. Elbow deep in mud, you fashioned us. You gifted us, gave us work to do. Made from the earth, made by your hand. We forgot who we were. We forgot who you were, and we tried to remake ourselves. We rejected your love and fell into sin and death. Yet even in our darkness, you continued to speak light and life. When we were slaves in a foreign land, you brought us out of our oppression, led us through the waters, and washed us up on the shores of a new life as a chosen people. As your people, we sometimes sought you and often strayed, but you were faithful to your promise and to us, and called yourself by our name. The God of Israel did not abandon the people, Israel, and you spoke of a day to come when you would come once more to save. And so we who live on the edge of this land look across the waters to the horizon. We come to live on the edge of your new and promised day, and we raise our voices with all the saints as we proclaim the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As we give, we also receive, and so I invite you to pull your hands into your chest as a sign of receiving. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, whose coming was announced by wilderness prophets and who arrived to the song of angels in the choir stall of a manger. In Jesus, you not only took our name, but our flesh. He was the one promised. He announced the new day and the acceptable year when blind folks would see and poor folks would rejoice, when captives would be set free and the oppressed would once more walk upright in liberty. In stories, he spoke of waiting bridesmaids and prodigal sons. With tears and compassion, he brought a dead man to life and gave a woman at a well the living water she sought. With anger, he overturned the tables and challenged the powerful. On the cross, he revealed the power of weakness, and in the emptiness of the tomb, he gave us a glimpse of your tomorrow that does not end in death. And in the night in which he gave himself up for us, he gathered with the disciples in the upper room, and he took a piece of bread, and he gave thanks to you, and he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took a cup, and he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we remember, and so we offer our praise and thanks and our very selves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's <laughs> offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ will come again. One of the oldest ways of being in prayer was not to clasp your hands and bow your head, but instead to lift your arms and face to God. I invite you to do that as we call for God to pour out the Spirit on us as we await your new day. So we call you to send your Spirit once more on this parched and thirsty land and on these elements of bread and the vine. 
Let them be for us once more Christ's body, and let us be once more Christ's body, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. With all the saints who share your name in our flesh, we raise this song until we hear in fullness the harmony of heaven. God of the dawn, Christ of the new day coming, spirit who is ever present, we wait for you this day, your day, and all the church says. Amen. I invite you as you are comfortable to continue to reach out your hands or to clasp hands as you are comfortable as a sign of blessing, as together with the confidence of children of God, we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who <laughs> trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. You may be seated. And if servers would please come forward. So in United Methodist Church, we practice an open communion table because this table is not owned by us, it's owned by Christ. So if you have any concerns about whether you are welcome, put them aside for all are welcome at Christ's table. You're invited to come down the center aisle and cup your hands, and we'll pace, place a piece of the bread into your hands. The bread is soy, egg, nut, uh, dairy-free, um, so everybody can take, partake of the one loaf. Take the piece of the bread and then dip it into the cup and receive both elements at the same time. Then you're invited to return to your seats by the side aisle or be in prayer at the kneeling rail. Come, for all things are ready. Come, taste and see that God is good.
let us pray. Infinite, intimate God, in this sacrament we have celebrated your presence with us. May we grow in the divine life of Christ who humbly shared our human life. Fill us with joy and send us out to share this good news with others. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who is our Emmanuel, and all the church says, Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable for our closing hymn as we seek to go forth to the world in hope. is it will be reading the Bible daily. So in your scripture insert on the inside are recommended scripture readings for each day of the week. There's a prayer for the week to help you do your daily prayer and scripture reading and questions to help you prepare for next Sunday. We move on to the ghost of Christmas present. Next Sunday is a contemporary worship service. So we invite you to take this home and make use of it during the week. Short blessing from Paul's letter to the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So go forth in hope, and may the love of the Father and the strength of the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Now go and be the church.
yes, and I made her copies. So. Yeah. No, I don't. They most a lot of what's in the hymn, a lot of what's in the hymn is copyrighted, and you can't just read it. Um, and it's not always. It's not always in song select. Okay. Um, some of them are, but I kind of usually just figure 